and welcome to the Humboldt Foundation's annual meeting of 2021. We hope that you enjoyed your unusually short flight here to Bonn. Well, we hope that last year's virtual meeting would stay a one-time exception and we would have loved to welcome you in Berlin this year. But I guess there is one good thing about this virtual setting that more of you can take part and spend the next two days with us. And I promise you we have a thrilling meeting prepared for you. There will be keynotes, science talks, lab visits, networking sessions, and a pub quiz. We will have contributions from a Nobel laureate and from the president of Germany, just to name a few highlights. Well, last year we welcomed more than 900 researchers from all over the world. And I'm very curious about this year's turn up. So if you haven't already done so, please make sure to say hello in the chat. Well, as you can see from our studio decoration, we have quite a journey planned for you in this opening ceremony. But before we take off again, I would like to introduce my co-host today, Enno Aufderheide, Secretary General of the Humboldt Foundation. Enno, please come and join me here. Yes, hello, Lisa. I'm really glad that I can join this event together with you. And it's an honor for us to have you here. Thank you. Enno, you brought something with you. What is that about? Yes, the do-it-yourself paper globe. We send out these do-it-yourself paper globes together with the invitation. And we asked you to print them out and glue them and mark the position that is home for you. Now, home isn't necessarily where you live. It could be where you were born, where you met your partner, any place that you feel closely connected to. So which place did you mark? Yes, I marked a place where I actually haven't lived for very long, but it's where I feel at home. It's northeast of Hamburg, many lakes, woods, fields, and it's a very comforting thing to be there. In general, I think I'm a water person. I love to walk along the river shore or seashore or here along the river banks in Bonn because we have this beautiful river Rhine close to the foundation. Well, actually, we thought we would turn this into a challenge. We want to see how your globe turned out and where you feel at home. So please take a picture of it and tweet it with the hashtag. You can see it in the back here, Progress Diversity. And among all submissions, we will raffle a prize. Well, and joining us today are researchers from various disciplines. We have engineers, social scientists, biologists, physicists, to historians and linguists. So it really is a very diverse network. Yes, and it has this great opportunity. Alexander von Humboldt said, unraveling the truth is not possible without the exchange of diverging opinions. Diverging, diversity, that's obviously related. And we think that um, diversity is key to unraveling the truth, as Humboldt would have said, or to innovation, to finding solutions for our challenges. I think it is time to start our journey, but before we make the big distances, we have some stops here in Germany to make. Um, let's first head over to Münster. This is where the president of this foundation lives and works. And um, besides being president of this foundation, he is also a researcher in neurophysiology at the University Hospital in Münster. Professor Pape, the stage is yours. Dear Humboldtians and guests, welcome to the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation's annual meeting. For the second time now, we are unable to meet face to face. You probably feel much as I do, a longing to get together again with people at last to go to the lecture hall, the lab, the seminar, the archives, the sports arena, without a mask and without social distancing. But before we can finally do all that again, we shall have to be patient for a little while longer. But that should not and cannot hold us back. We want to get together and talk to one another. We want to be curious, want to find out where everybody else comes from, what they're working on, and what they dream of. Our virtual annual meeting last year showed that we can manage all that online. Where there is a Humboldtian, there is a way. This year's motto is diversity of ideas, because diversity is what enables good research. 
Diversity is also the hallmark of our worldwide Humboldt network. And it is you, the Humboldians, who are the source of this diversity. With your individual personalities, your histories and your talents. For us, scientific talent, your talent, is the core of our sponsorship, irrespective of background, gender, religion or discipline. At the Humboldt Foundation, we sponsor researchers from more than 140 countries on this planet, be they from India or Pakistan, Cameroon or South Africa, Peru or Mexico, the UK or France, China or the United States. Because the diversity of ideas and perspectives is worth its weight in gold. Business, for instance, has long since recognized the connection between mixed teams and commercial success. And in science, too, it is common knowledge and lived experience that opposites and different perspectives often generate the best ideas and outcomes, especially with regard to the complex task and multifaceted challenges we are facing in the world. Many people would certainly subscribe to this. But is this also reflected in reality? It is certainly true that there's a lot of talk about diversity, but the higher we climb the career ladder in science, for instance, the less diversity we encounter. And at the Humboldt Foundation, we want to recruit the best talents and top minds in science, in all their diversity and with all their potential. We are an organization that strives to recognize, value and actively promote innovation, a multiplicity of perspectives, variety and diversity. But we cannot do this if we always remain entrenched in the same segment or simply lean back and say the world is as it is. Quite the opposite. We must act proactively and purposefully. And this is exactly what we are doing, focusing on four core elements. Firstly, enhancing visibility. Meetings like this and our hashtag Progress Diversity campaign serve this purpose. Just take a look, take part, let us share your experiences. Secondly, analyzing causes and potential. We do this by evaluating our work, for example, and conducting an analysis on international scientific potential, to which we compare different countries and see where we are falling short. We investigate then the path dependencies and subnetworks that ensue from a lack of diversity. And we demonstrate how the various dimensions of diversity dismantle such path dependencies and help to avoid the risk of structural rigidities. Thirdly, selection and monitoring. When selecting new Humboldians, we of course look at scientific performance, but we are at least as interested in the individual's future potential. So we also consider career phase, regional background and personal circumstances. And finally, not to the least, targeted support. Our new Henrietta Hertz scouting program, for instance, is designed to discover new talents quickly integrate them in our network and thus make it more diverse. Ladies and gentlemen, our topic of diversity is also related to equity. Diversity is also about the unfair distribution of opportunity in different spheres of life, be they the social environment, country or continent. During the global pandemic, we are experiencing these injustices, the limits of international solidarity and the fatal impact of unequal economic conditions particularly grievously. Let us, in the Humboldt network, send a counter signal, demonstrating what scientific collaboration across borders can achieve. Show how our scientific ideals can take the global community forward. Let us change the world with the diversity of our ideas. The Humboldtians Dear guests, we are delighted and highly honored that the Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier will be speaking to us and thus continuing that tradition of esteem for our network that is dear to us and much appreciated. The support the Humboldt Foundation receives from German politicians and the ministries that fund us sends an important message, particularly during the pandemic. 
continuing to resolutely promote science and international exchange is a wise investment. It not only helps to find the pandemic and its negative impacts, it also reinforces our resilience to future crises. And all of you, the Humboldtians, and your work play a role in this. Those of you who follow the Foundation on Twitter will have heard about success stories in the Humboldt Network on an almost daily basis. And on behalf of everyone, I would like to highlight just one of them and congratulate our Humboldtian Emmanuel Charpentier, who is with us today online for her research on the CRISPR-Cas9 system and her development of the so-called genetic scissors. A really path-breaking discovery which has heralded a veritable revolution in the life sciences and their applications. Together with Jennifer Doudna, Emmanuel Charpentier was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year. Our warmest congratulations. After all the years in which only four women in total were awarded the Nobel Prize in this field, some people judged the fact that two women were now honored as a further indication that something in our system needs to change. Others see it as evidence that something is changing not least because a truly path-breaking idea was honored just a short time after being developed instead of decades later, as has usually been the case. I'm curious what you think about this. So, let's take the opportunity to talk to one another. Let the ideas roll. Talk about yourself and your research and listen to what others have to say. Enjoy our annual meeting. I think the diverse access to science is probably one of the most important discussions in scientific culture right now. I'm glad the Foundation is taking action on it. Yes, and action is not only about policy and governance and money, it's also about emotions. And this is why we have asked you to show your love for diversity by singing, dancing or playing an instrument. So we asked you to send us short video clips to one special tune. And Voila, here are some of your very unique contributions. Dear guests at the Humboldt Foundation's annual meeting. The Foundation is located in Bonn, 
a stone's throw from the Rhine. And everybody who knows the Rhine that knows that everything that takes place there more than once immediately becomes a tradition. But you don't need to be a native of the Rhineland to recognize that the federal president's reception for the Humboldt family is a genuine tradition. We have been enjoying this privilege for decades now, and we are very pleased about it and feel honored. I have to admit, I can hardly imagine an annual meeting without the federal president. And I know from many conversations that our network feels the same. The reception with you, Mr. President, is an experience our Humboldtians and their families do not forget. The message that comes across and remains in our international guest memories is you are important to us. You are most welcome in Germany. We are looking forward to hearing the words of welcome from Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier. Liebe Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde der Humboldt Stiftung, zu den festen Terminen im Kalender des Bundespräsidenten gehört der Empfang für die Humboldtianerinnen und Humboldtianer und ihre Familien hier im schönen Park von Schloss Bellevue. Warum wir das auch in diesem Jahr leider nicht hier an Ort und Stelle tun können, wissen Sie. Nach den guten Erfahrungen mit der digitalen Jahrestagung im vergangenen Jahr denke ich, dass es auch in diesem Jahr für uns und Sie alle dennoch ein schönes, bereicherndes und die Gemeinschaft vertiefendes Ereignis sein wird. Aber dennoch spüren wir schmerzhaft, nichts kann wirklich die direkte menschliche Begegnung ersetzen. Und nichts kann die weltweite Vernetzung und die bunte internationale Zusammengehörigkeit in der Humboldt-Stiftung sichtbarer machen, als wenn um die 1000 Tagungsteilnehmer zusammenkommen und sich persönlich treffen und austauschen können. Aber auch bei dieser digitalen Tagung wird die Gemeinschaft wieder erlebbar, die sie alle miteinander verbindet. Die Gemeinschaft der Forschenden, die durch ein hohes Ethos und durch leidenschaftlichen Willen zur Erkenntnis bewegt wird. Die internationale Gemeinschaft derer, die durch ihre tagtägliche Arbeit den Fortschritt der Wissenschaft ermöglichen. Die Gemeinschaft derer, die sich nie mit dem einmal Erreichten, dem einmal Gewussten, dem einmal für wahr Gehaltenen zufrieden geben. Die wissen, dass hinter jeder Erkenntnis neue Fragen auftauchen und hinter jeder Lösung eine neue Herausforderung. Wir in Deutschland sind stolz darauf und wir können uns glücklich schätzen, dass wir es so vielen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern aus so vielen Ländern der Welt ermöglichen können, ihre Forschungen eine Zeit lang hier bei uns zu betreiben und dass wir es deutschen Forschenden ermöglichen können, in der ganzen Welt ihren Horizont zu erweitern. Sie alle grüße ich, Sie alle ermutige ich, Ihrer wissenschaftlichen Leidenschaft weiter zu folgen. Und ich gestehe, dass ich vor Ihnen allen einen großen Respekt und eine hohe Achtung habe. Präsident Pape hat in seiner Eröffnungsrede gerade vom diesjährigen Motto gesprochen. Vielfalt der Ideen. Und tatsächlich ist es ja in der letzten Zeit kaum ein Thema gesellschaftlich und politisch so virulent und so sehr Gegenstand des Nachdenkens und der Diskussion wie Vielfalt, Diversität. Davon ist selbstverständlich auch die Wissenschaft zentral betroffen. Es gibt zunächst eine Vielfalt der wissenschaftlichen Disziplinen. Das gilt zum einen sicher für die grobe Unterscheidung zwischen Naturwissenschaften und Geisteswissenschaften. Das gilt aber auch, und ich denke, dass Sie das alle längst mehr als einmal erfahren haben, auch zwischen Wissenschaften, die sehr benachbart erscheinen. Jede Form von interdisziplinärem Austausch ist zunächst von der Erfahrung von Unterschieden geprägt. Es gibt auch eine Vielfalt wissenschaftlicher Kulturen, die oft lange und tiefe Wurzeln in ihrer Mentalitäts- und kulturgeschichtlichen Erfahrung haben. Das kennen wir schon hier im kleinen Kontinent und Europa, aber das wird noch einmal ganz besonders erfahrbar 
im interkontinentalen Austausch. Die Humboldt-Stiftung hat gerade in dieser Hinsicht eine ganz große Chance. Sie kann nicht nur diese Unterschiede wissenschaftlicher Kulturen erfahrbar machen, sie kann auch erfahrbar machen, wie es fruchtbar sein kann, wenn man solche Diversität zulässt und wenn man solche Diversität als bereichernd und als erkenntnisfördernd begreift. Es kann auch anstrengend sein. Diversität wirklich zu akzeptieren ist tatsächlich eine ethische, eine kulturelle, eine gesellschaftliche, eine politische Herausforderung. Aber Diversität akzeptieren und dabei trotz und bei allen Unterschieden versuchen, einem gemeinsamen Ziel zu folgen, das ist der Königsweg zu einer gerechten Gesellschaft und der Königsweg zu wissenschaftlichen Erfolgen. Ein Weg, der weiterführt und tiefer blicken lässt, weil er keinen Ausgangspunkt und keinen Blick von vornherein ausschließt. Ich wünsche uns und Ihnen allen von Herzen, dass Sie diese anstrengende Diversität aushalten und diese lohnende Diversität erfahren. Ich wünsche Ihnen allen, dass Sie bei dieser virtuellen Tagung einiges davon schon oder wieder miteinander teilen können. Und allen unseren Gästen wünsche ich, dass Sie bald oder wenn Sie einmal wiederkommen, ein Deutschland ohne Lockdown erleben können. Wir freuen uns immer auf Sie. Ihnen allen einen herzlichen Dank. You must feel very honored that the president of Germany is such a big supporter of your and the foundation's work. Yes, it's a great honor and a wonderful gesture of welcome. I know from many, many Humboldians whom I meet that this reception in the park of the Bellevue Palace in Berlin is the highlight of the welcoming culture and atmosphere in Germany during their time in Germany. And now we have another honor to introduce you to one of the stars of the Humboldt Network. And I remember a couple of years back, I was sitting on the floor of a very crowded, very full conference room in Washington DC because I really wanted to see her keynote about a, a discovery she had made. And last year, for that discovery, for the development of a method for genome editing, she won the Nobel Prize of Chemistry, Emmanuel Charpentier. Yes, uh, I, I'm a biologist and I, I really appreciate this revolutionizing effect that this discovery, the CRISPR-Cas9, some people call it the molecular scalpel or the gene scissors, uh, and it has this, this revolutionizing effect. As the Humboldt Foundation, we really try to fund excellence. We want to give space so that can, people can really make groundbreaking discoveries as Emmanuel Charpentier has made. And actually, the first major award that recognized this uh, discovery of hers was the Alexander von Humboldt Professorship, the most highly endowed research award in Germany, which she won already in 2014, so six years before the Nobel Prize. So I guess let's head over to Berlin then. Emmanuel Charpentier, the stage is yours. Thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to participate uh, at the, the meeting of this year and to be with you this year. So, so first of all, with regard to diversity, it's uh, very uh, crucial <laughs> to explain that uh, in science, in biology, but I believe it's uh, the, the same for other types of, of sciences, it's all about people and indeed multidisciplinarity. So people, because diversity of people bring diverse cultures, diverse genders, and uh, this is always very fruitful to to bring new ideas and, and challenge initial ideas because it's a teamwork. Uh, it's multidisciplinary because in our days, uh, actually, uh, biology has become more and more specialized. And so we need uh, different experts around the table. And also in my lab, uh, I have the, the challenge to, to train uh, young students and postdocs from different horizons in different types of specialties. Uh, the new discoveries come from a, a mixture of, of ideas, of, uh, of people, of cultures, of uh, methodologies. And this is really, really critical that 
the universities and other types of schools that are training the young generation uh, have this in mind and, and increase this diversity, this internationality even more. And this is really, I think, what the young, the young uh, students actually expect as well and, and, and want to have. If I reflect to what is going on in, in my lab, uh, they, the most part I think that they enjoy is to be in this uh, multicultural, uh, multidisciplinary environment. Yeah, I think there is no, <laughs> there is no miraculous uh, recipe for scientists. I think what is really important is to learn to know oneself and learn, um, you know, uh, one owns uh, uh, limitations, strengths and weaknesses and, and work in this direction. Um, but I think what has helped me a lot is actually I was lucky enough to <laughs> to be, um, let's say, I, I would not like to say passionate because I don't like specifically this word, maybe more obsessed by what I was doing and very curious and determined to, to, um, to find my niche in science whereby I will develop uh, my own uh, uh, research that could ultimately lead to uh, a new topic of research for uh, the community of, of scientists. But what has helped me a lot is to keep always my curiosity, uh, to keep a certain, uh, I would say, freshness. So I, I had the tendency to go very fast with uh, the projects I was starting <laughs> and to go on um, very fast and multiple times to uh, other places. And this was for me, uh, what I realized was key for my own uh, success. Alexander von Humboldt Foundation was key for me to, to go to Germany and to accept a, a, a position at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research and Medical School of Hannover uh, uh, because it was uh, the perfect tool that I needed at the time. Uh, with uh, the possibility to enter a, a network of international uh, scientists and, and renowned scientists and, and young scientists who, who want to, to go on with their career and also uh, a, a platform which I think is, is very attractive for uh, scientists joining a country but also scientists in general. So I'm very much looking forward to give the keynote lecture at the meeting in 2022. The keynote lecture that has been postponed twice already because of the pandemic, which will give me uh, the opportunity to discuss about the, the CRISPR discovery, but also about the research going on in my lab that is pretty much linked to what we are facing uh, right now with viral infections, that is uh, uh, really about understanding how bacteria cause uh, diseases in humans. We also have a project actually on SARS-CoV-2. And to explain uh, the CRISPR discovery that uh, originates from understanding how bacteria defend themselves against viral infection. So obviously we can be infected by viruses and we have uh, immune systems that allow ourselves to, to fight viral infections. And bacteria can also be infected by some uh, other types of tiny, <laughs> tiny viruses and they have developed immune system and this is such an immune system that has led to this uh, revolutionary CRISPR uh, gene editing technology, so I will explain this. So now it's really time to start our journey across the globe. We asked some of you to tell us how your background has influenced your perspective on the world. How did it influence your academic career and where do you draw your creativity from? Yes, and let's first go to Africa, to Nigeria, and meet Tojin Odeku. She's a pharmacist and a mother of three, and I think she will share her perspective on how to reconcile motherhood and an academic career. And our next stop after Nigeria will be the Czech Republic, where you will meet biophysicist Michal Kolasz. 
He will share a story of how spending some time abroad has changed his perspective on academia and the importance of rich academic cultures. So, safe travels. We'll see you in a bit. Ekaro, Bogwe Nyara, Oruko Mini Iyafi, Oluwato Nyodeku, Ojogmoni Mini Ilewe University, Ilewe Kogiga University, Tidu Ibadan, in Nigeria. I don't think it's fair to ask a woman to choose either the family or a career. You could actually have a blend. And then you should, a woman should not, because she's a woman, be delayed, you know, unnecessarily because, of course, it's publish or perish in academia. You have to show sign and you have to publish papers. If you do not have time for research, you cannot publish. So it's a, you know, chain effect. And so uh, they should not be made to choose. The message is you can actually have the best of the two worlds. You raise a successful family and you also progress in your academic career. I grew up the first 18, 19 years of my life in the northern part of Nigeria. And this is a part of the country where it is believed that women can, should be seen and not heard. And uh, just, I think last year, our president was quoted as saying the place of the woman is in the kitchen or in the other room. So for me, it was um, kind of a challenge having to balance that, trying to write papers, and you know also raising small children you know young family was quite a challenge for me and i discovered that if my supervisor was not a good mentor i probably would have dropped off at some point Dobrý večer, my jméno je Michal Kolář, pocházím z České republiky a pracuji na Vysoké škole chemicko-technologické jako odborný asistent. Vedu skupinu, která studuje dynamiku biomolekul, konkrétně těch, které se zaměřují na proteosyntézu. The scientific mobility is beneficial, but lot, many, many Czech students or, or young researchers don't know the benefits uh, and don't know what to expect. How about sharing the experience of those who actually overcame the activation barrier and traveled abroad? It's a great challenge to, to change the place. It's not only about yourself or the person who is moving. He or she doesn't live in a vacuum. Uh, for instance, I moved with my family. where We had a, uh, a newborn kid. The step was challenging in many different ways. Being abroad uh, opens new horizons, new perspectives. I'm not exactly sure if traveling and, and being sort of international person uh, helps you being creative, but it definitely helps you seeing different ways of solving problems. You know what I really like about science is that it connects people. People from all over the world, no matter where they live, they can collaborate, they can solve problems together, they can move all over the world to work. So I think science might be a pretty good model for all of us to live and work together across the globe. Wow, I, I really like that idea of the Humboldt family as a model for a better world. And actually, yes, we try to do exactly what you, what you say and do our share in building trust between nations, bringing brilliant minds together so that they can work on solutions. And the reason that we can do that is that we have very strong support, both in the German parliament and in the government. So I would say let's head over to Berlin and hear from them. Yes, that's very good. Uh, we can actually meet uh, Minister of State Michel Müntefering from the Federal Foreign Office. The Federal Foreign Office is not only uh, the sponsor of most of our fellowships, 
they also grant the Humboldt Alumni Award that I talked about and we have recipients among the voices from Humboldtians we hear today. So I'd say, let's go to Berlin. Liebe Humboldt-Familie, liebe Gäste, lieber Herr Pape, Science Matters, das haben wir im vergangenen Corona-Jahr noch einmal sehr deutlich vor Augen geführt bekommen. Ohne internationale wissenschaftliche Zusammenarbeit lassen sich die globalen Herausforderungen nicht lösen. Weder eine Pandemie noch der Klimawandel. Und deshalb sind Wissenschaftsnetzwerke wie Ihres so wichtig. Wir brauchen mehr geteiltes Wissen, mehr Vielfalt an Perspektiven und auch mehr internationale Zusammenarbeit. Und genau dafür steht die Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. Schon zum zweiten Mal findet die Jahrestagung der Stiftung jetzt digital statt. Und das ist schade, denn wer einmal dabei war, der weiß, die Jahrestagung ist immer ein echtes Highlight, ein Treffen, bei dem man spannende Menschen kennenlernt, neue Freundschaften schließt und wichtige Impulse auch für die eigene Arbeit mitbekommt. Gleichzeitig ist die zweite digitale Jahrestagung aber auch ein Beweis für die Stärke und die Anpassungsfähigkeit ihres Netzwerks. Ich bin mir sicher, wenn Alexander von Humboldt heute leben würde, dann würde er nicht nur auf Vulkane klettern, sondern auch die ganze Palette der digitalen Kommunikation nutzen. So wie Sie das eben auch mit Ihrer Jahrestagung tun. Vielfalt, das ist das Leitmotiv Ihrer Tagung in diesem Jahr. Und ich finde, das richtige Thema zur richtigen Zeit. Denn Vielfalt an Perspektiven, das ist nicht nur die Voraussetzung für Fortschritt. Es ist auch das Fundament unserer Demokratie. Mehr Offenheit für Menschen mit unterschiedlichen Hintergründen, mehr Frauen in Führungspositionen, mehr Einsatz für wissenschaftliche und gesellschaftliche Freiheit. Das sind deshalb auch zentrale Themen unserer Wissenschaftsdiplomatie. Und für die Jahrestagung wünsche ich Ihnen allen inspirierende und schöne Momente, wenn auch mit digitalen Begegnungen und mit den Qualitäten, für die die Humboldt-Familie seit jeher steht. Neugier, Offenheit und einem grenzenüberschreitenden Diskurs. Alles Gute, viel Spaß. So now we'll continue our journey and listen to a few more voices of researchers. And next, we're headed to... Argentina. Yes, and we listen to Rodrigo Gaston Kibiliscu, an atmospheric chemist. He will tell us what motivated him to work for better air quality in Argentina. And then directly we'll move a long way to Central Asia, to Uzbekistan. And we will hear from an Uzbek historian, Deluza Duturayeva. She is engaging for more gender equality in the humanities in Central Asia. So, safe travels. Mi nombre es Rodrigo Gibilisco, soy de Tucumán, Argentina y trabajo en la Universidad Nacional de Tucumán como investigador en química atmosférica y contaminación del aire. I was born in Tucumán, it's the smallest province in Argentina, uh, and it is known as the Garden of the Republic. So I grew up in a, in a town surrounded by mountains and forests and sugarcane crops, a lot of sugarcane crops. One day, in one of our bicycle rides, uh, we saw a field of sugarcane on fire. Uh, and we thought it was an accident, but my grandmother didn't look very surprised. So she explained it to me that this was normal and that the burning, the sugarcane fields, helped the farmers to remove the dry leaves from the sugarcane plants before the harvest. So, but it was until many years later, uh, when I began to study chemistry and atmospheric science, 
that I began to question what I believe as normal. Science demonstrated that fires contribute enormously to the emission of toxic gases and small particles into the air. And when we breathe them, they cause serious health problems. The essence of the Breathe to Change initiative is to create a network of people and institutions with a common goal to improve the quality of the air the people breathe in those places where breathing polluted air is seen as something normal or harmless. I think that um, diversity of ideas, uh, particularly a knowledge creating process, uh, means having a wide variety of perspectives leading to better decisions and outcomes. However, access to certain types of knowledge is still a privilege in many places in the world, especially for, for women. I'm from Uzbekistan, I was born there and I was raised in Uzbekistan. And when I was um, at school, I was very interested in history and I loved to read history books, but I always read mainly about um, men, so about kings and about warriors and scientists. They all were men. For me, it was, it was a little bit strange. And I was looking for more females in history. So history is a very ancient discipline and was written mainly until recently by men and about men. We need more women researchers to illuminate the female viewpoint of history, I would say. Anzi Santal. Central Asia, that's actually the title of a three-volume book that Humboldt wrote himself and published in 1843, summarizing all the results of his travel to Russia, to Central Asia. And that is a very sweet story because he had dreamt of going to Central Asia to see the plains, the steppe and the mountains and the Caspian Sea. And he dreamt for, for decades. And then when he was almost 60 years old, the Russian Tsar invited him and he was able to go. He covered more than 12,000 miles in horse coach and made really groundbreaking discoveries. And uh, so it's a story that I, that I really like a lot. Well, probably you could say that Humboldt as being one of the most famous world travelers of all times probably, he might have enjoyed what we're doing today, visiting I'm different sure. countries and different people, different ideas. Well, what's up next? Um, well, I think we move back from history to our days because we want to talk to another person who makes our work possible. As I said, we have this strong uh, support from the parliament and the government. And I also mentioned when we talked about Emmanuel Charpentier, the Alexander von Humboldt professorship, this most highly endowed research award in Germany brings top-notch researchers to Germany for permanent professorships. And this program is sponsored by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And it was extended last year, as I learned, um, by additional Humboldt professorships for artificial intelligence, also under the uh, gov German government's AI strategy. Exactly, yes. And to have this Humboldt professorship for artificial intelligence actually was the idea of Professor Wolf-Dieter Lukas, who is now State Secretary in the Research Ministry. And so we hand over to him. Herr Staatssekretär, Sie haben das Wort. Liebe Humboldtianerinnen und Humboldtianer, das Thema der diesjährigen Jahrestagung der Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, Diversity of Ideas, ist gut gewählt. Die großen Herausforderungen der Gegenwart und Zukunft können wir ohne vielfältige, aber auch kontroverse Ideen und Perspektiven nicht meistern. Die Wirtschaftswissenschaften haben zum Beispiel lange und intensiv darum gerungen, ob ein Emissionshandel ohne eine CO2-Steuer besser das Klima schützen kann. 
Mittlerweile sehen wir in vielen Ländern, wir brauchen beide Ansätze für ein stimmiges Gesamtkonzept. Ohne Diversity of Ideas gibt es, meine Damen und Herren, keine Exzellenz. Weltweiter Austausch und Mobilität, aber eben auch die Geschlechtergleichstellung fördern zum Beispiel Diversity of Ideas. Deutschland hat wie kein zweites Land davon profitiert, dass Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler über die ganze Welt verteilt zusammenarbeiten und mobil sind. Und auch die langsamen, aber doch merklichen Fortschritte bei der Gleichstellung der Geschlechter in der Wissenschaft waren nicht nur überfällig, sondern sie haben uns auch sehr genutzt. Frau Professorin Carpenty, von der Sie heute noch hören werden, aber auch Herr Schahin, Frau Türici von Biontech sind der lebende Beleg für diese beiden Punkte. Das Bundesministerium für Bildung und Forschung setzt sich entschlossen dafür ein, die wissenschaftliche Mobilität aufrechtzuerhalten und weiter zu stärken. Die Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung ist ein zentraler Partner dabei. Und während der Pandemie konnten unter gewissen Auflagen weiterhin Forschende und Studierende nach Deutschland einreisen. Und wir werden die negativen Auswirkungen des Brexits und des Ausscheidens des Vereinigten Königsreichs aus Erasmus auffangen. In Deutschland ist für uns klar, die großen Wissenschaftsorganisationen können sich nicht auf den bisherigen Fortschritten bei der Geschlechtergleichstellung ausruhen. Es sind ambitionierte Ziele und schlüssige Konzepte nötig, nach Corona umso mehr. Meine Damen und Herren, Diversity of Ideas ist keine Selbstverständlichkeit. Es gibt sie nur, wenn kluge Menschen zueinander kommen und sich einbringen können. Ich lade Sie ein, kämpfen Sie weiter dafür, geben Sie sich nicht mit dem Erreichten zufrieden. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich Ihnen interessante Diskussionen bei dieser Jahrestagung. Soon we'll end our journey, but before we'll listen to two more voices from this network. First, we'll send you over to Bulgaria, where you'll meet Diljana Boteva Bojanova. She's a historian and, among other things, she works with ancient coins. And after that, we'll send you over to Nepal, where you'll meet Anu Kumari Lama. Здравейте от България, казвам се Диляна Ботева и съм професор в Софийски университет. Безкрайно съм щастлива да бъда част от годишната среща на Хумболтовата фундация 2021 година. I am a student of two professors at the university who had totally different approach to scientific work, to scientific research. And uh, it came so that uh, almost every time when they have a discussion, they, they uh, defended totally different, absolutely opposite uh, opinions. And I was assistant professor of both of them. So I decided very early in my uh, growth as a historian to find my own way in these debates that were really constantly ongoing in our office. I had in my two professors a real personification of diversity of ideas. Society is so colorful. Nature is colorful. Nature has created us colorful. And we are obliged to, to protect it. Namaste, my name is Anukumari Lama. I am an Antarashtri Ekikrit Parvatiya Vikas Kendra, or EC Mode, in this country. I am working in the same way. Thank you. Throughout my life, uh, whether it's my academic research or professional, uh, you know, um, um, upbringing or, you know, relationship is very much revolved around the mountains. And that's why I consider mountains as my universities. 
as my research lab there is so much you know learnings to be done in relation to you know how the society functions in relation to nature and what does nature provide to the mountain communities if i have to reflect back you know why do i have uh, this sort of a, a responsibility is or you know why i work at the intersectionality of the policy science and 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 the practice is that you see um and during my uh, you know engagement as a fellow at the humboldt and and during my research uh, time what i have learned is that science is a collective endeavor and that's why you know i i thought because it is good to bring that voice uh, to this global audience uh, and and obviously because uh, had it not been for the humble uh, foundations international climate protection fellowship you know i wouldn't be able to really bring this to the global audience I'm sure that you've noticed we have changed and you probably also recognize our new outfits, the conference shirts you must have had in your mail too. And I have to admit I'm very impressed by your parrots. Did you draw them yourself? Mm -mm. <laughs> They were drawn by my wife. See, she is so much better in these things than I am and I felt everybody can enjoy nicely painted uh, parrots. Why did you choose the parrots? Well, I think both are are connected to Humboldt. When he was young, he went to the Amazon, and there's a famous letter where he says that he almost goes crazy because of all those wonders and colors. And if I read that, I think of the Ara. And um, this one is a Vasa a parrot, actually from Madagascar. And when Humboldt was old, he had a Vasa parrot at home, and this Vasa parrot could could talk. It would say. Viel Kaffee, viel Zucker seifert. We talked about this during the last annual assembly. And, um, well, they also stand for diversity, for biodiversity, for threatened biodiversity, because we know both the Amazon and Madagascar are threatened. And what is it on your T-shirt? Is it a, It's a camera, obviously, and a, a female? A female scientist, exactly, because um, I think if you watch talk shows or TV, it's almost always men who are the experts who are invited as experts. And I think we should change that. We should see more women who um, share their opinion on certain topics as experts. Yes, diversity in science journalism. Exactly. And we also asked you to draw on your t-shirts. So please, if you feel like it, take a selfie and post it on Instagram or Twitter, again with the hashtag Progress Diversity, and show us Share your story, why you think that more diversity is needed in academia and science. Oh, Lisa, we've been talking so much. Is it time for a drink? Oh, yes, it sure is. I guess you and me were ready for the next thing that's coming up. I mentioned it earlier already, the pub quiz. Exactly. And uh, if I think of those annual assemblies, they are about fun, about being together, about discussing. And we were thinking, how can we transfer that into the virtual space? And this is why we came up with the idea of a pub quiz. I really liked that idea when I heard about it. I have this very small club I go to with my friends and colleagues, normally before the pandemic for a pub quiz. And sometimes I feel a kind of pressure on me when it comes to the scientific questions, because if I don't know the answers to sports questions, for example, it doesn't matter, but everyone expects me as a science journalist to know the answers when it comes to science. But um, when I thought about it, I thought this is a pub quiz next level because you have hundreds of the smartest minds from all around the world uh, being together in a pub quiz. Did that ever before happen? I don't think so. Let's consider an experiment. And there are also prizes to win. So grab a cold beverage of your choice, grab some snacks, and this will probably be an opportunity for you to meet new friends or meet people you already know. Well, it seems that we have come to an end, but I really enjoyed doing this together with you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Eno. It was a pleasure for me too. And now we hope to see you at the pub quiz. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs>